Um, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Professor Rockman. Rockford, Professor Rockford. And also, I want to thank Jim Lansing for um, inviting me as well. And thanks to all of you for coming out um, on this particularly soggy, rainy evening. But um, I also, of course, want to thank the Christina Roldan, who's in the back, who's been the project manager, helping me with this uh, artist in residence project for going on 15 months now and uh, to the cultural division for selecting me for the project and also to the, you know, I always forget the actual names of the places. So it's the Broward County Cultural Division and Public Art Division. You could see how that would be difficult. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, and then the airport is officially called the A Broward County Aviation Department. Is that correct? I'm hoping so. Let's see, see, there's a lot of entities involved, but at any rate, so I want to thank all of those people involved. Um, but yeah, so this this project that I'll be talking about today is a really um, kind of unique artist residency that's also a public art commission, and that's what I'll the will form the focus of my talk today. But I'll also talk about past projects in relation to um, the work that I'm doing here. So. To start, I want to get a little bit of background on, on what it means to serve as an artist in residence at an airport during a major construction project, which probably sounds a bit unorthodox to many of you, and it, it did to me as it began. It did to all parties involved. It's kind of been a, a work in progress that we sort out as we go along, but it's been a really, really fun experience. Is this working, this microphone switch? Okay. Um, so, I'm just going to start with a, a pragmatic description of the project for you all. I've been maintaining a blog throughout this process that you can actually visit. It's um, linked to my, uh, through my website if you go to the links page from, at dawnrow.com. But the project itself centers around the construction of a new runway at the Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport. Many of you have probably seen the, uh, uh, this process unfolding as you drive down different parts of the highway around the periphery of this space. Um, but my involvement as artist in residence began basically around April of 2013. And since that time, I've made regular visits to the site. And I've been witness to both kind of gradual and dramatic transformations. Um, it's actually, as someone that doesn't live here full time, it might be a different experience for me to encounter this space um, when I go away and come back than it is for those that live here and see it day to day, or especially those that have been working, breaking their backs on the site over all of these months as well. It's been pretty um, amazing to see. But um, so basically, this massive undertaking involves a really significant transformation of the physical surround. Most significantly, I've been witness to the gradual fabrication of a tiny mountain, which I like to think of it as, um, with an elevation of about 65 feet. So this, of course, is now the runway, and that elevation was necessary to clear um, US-1 that runs underneath. And one of the primary components of this construction involved gathering the material for what has become this kind of mountain. And you know, as we know, we're in Florida, we're kind of on this uh, swampy land. It's not like you could just uh, build a mountain out of nothing. You had to bring the stuff in from somewhere. So I've kind of become sort of a attached to this fabricated mountain that has been created. And um, what got that there were there were um, regularly scheduled trains that deliver these massive quantities of limestone. And as I gather, they came from nearby quarries in Pompano and Medley. And basically, this process kind of started that was this continual kind of piling, smoothing, and grading, and just moving all of this massive material all around the space and slowly transforming a very flat wetland into a, a, a runway that goes 65 feet into the air, but you don't really notice it now. It's, it's interesting to drive over the space. So at any rate, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a construction worker. What does an artist do with all of this stuff? Where do I come in? Well, uh, they asked me to come in as an artist and just kind of respond to these transformations and note these gradual and dramatic shifts and creatively kind of um, document, narrate, or depict what was happening at the site. 
So that's been my challenge over the last while. And what you'll see today are some of the, the images that basically make up the archive. And um, so my first very short-term visit resulted in kind of just an initial record. I was kind of just making my way around the space, getting to know things. Um, and as I said, so what, what ended up happening is I've kind of amassed this archive of thousands upon thousands of images and hours of video footage. And, but what's probably important to think about is I am an artist that uses photographs and video documentation. Um, I don't really paint, sculpt, or draw. So there's sometimes um, an assumption attached to what one m might do with photographic documentation. And so I, I want to sort of emphasize that I'm not necessarily documenting the process of the construction itself with my photographs. Um, I'm not literally track, uh, tracking the changes in any, any kind of scientific or methodical manner. My imagery is um, perhaps a bit more ambiguous and sometimes difficult to, to decipher. This image itself might be one of my more straightforward images, I suppose. But um, overall, my concern has not been with constructing any sort of like temporal continuum showing the actual progress of the construction. But um, instead, it's really more about allowing the very nature of the structural and, and um, ecological um, transformations to kind of dictate my response. Um, you know, here's an image that's a bit more of an abstraction. So, you know, I might put it another way. I could say that I'm, I'm a bit more interested in the deep kind of ecological time evoked by the layered strata of Earth, as we saw in the previous image, or in the seemingly infinite experience of a plastic flag gently flapping frozen midair in a still photograph or slowed and repeated in a video representation. So I'll show you a small excerpt of one of the videos that's actually looping in Terminal 1 right now. So this is an excerpt that loops continuously. It's kind of a small vignette. And um, before I go on and continue talking, I, I wanted to also mention that the, the sort of talk that I've put together for you tonight is around 30 to 35 minutes. I'm, I'm really hoping for a bit of conversation when I'm finished. So if there are things that I mention um, that you would like me to talk about further or questions you have, if you want to just jot those down as I talk, I'd love to entertain some questions or just have a discussion after. Um, so I'll move on from that clip. Um, yeah, so, so basically this is the placard that's in Terminal 1 right now, uh, along with a few, um, or five single channel videos actually. So I'm, I'm ultimately going to be producing a suite of works using this primary source material that I've been collecting on site to craft these secondary works um, that are going to combine the multiple photographic stills and video clips and uh, resulting in what will be a series of uh, light boxes and freestanding video kiosks and a wall mural and they'll be placed kind of throughout the airport. Most are still in progress but as mentioned the videos in Terminal 1 went up last October um, and this is actually you can see them it's kind of funny because they exist in and amongst like the CNN news feed which I kind of like I think is just sort of amusing, they just kind of are, are there, they don't necessarily announce themselves and you just, uh, they just coexist with CNN. Um, but, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, another thing that is currently up is, uh, as Lisa mentioned, uh, in the Lee Wagoner Art Gallery in Terminal 2, there's an installation of 10 light boxes of which um, consist of these 10 images and you're welcome to go view those. They're actually in the pre-security area right next to a big bulk sweet shop if you need to get some candy. Um, 
So, um, what else about that? Yeah, well, what else about that is I'm actually going to be doing my community studio hours right in that gallery uh, this week. So if any of you want to spend some time with me in there, those are the three dates that I'm going to be there, Friday, Monday, and Wednesday. And you can come hang out with me and we can talk about this project further and you can um, engage in some art making with me if you're so interested. But so as I mentioned earlier, um, because I live and work in Winter Park, where I uh, teach at Rollins College, many of my visits have been short-term, a few days at a time, um, but they've been punctuated with some longer-term visits, including this one, which has me here through next week. And one of the more, I suppose, unorthodox activities that I suggested was um, this idea of the community studio in the airport. And I've done, that's me, Christina took that image. Thank you, Christina. <laughs> be fiddling around with stuff in the space, but um, there have been two community studios thus far. Um, I did one last December and one last May, and basically, as you can see here, it's just kind of an ad hoc space. I brought materials directly into the studio and worked on the project while interacting with travelers that were kind of curious or also talked a lot to the people who worked at the airport and the airport ambassadors, which I found really intriguing. But um, you know, because this project relies upon repeated visits to the airport, um, to the site and its periphery, um, certain aspects of my studio practice became kind of portable. I had to figure out how I could work a little bit more on the fly. So I thought it might be feasible to set up this kind of ad hoc space. And so I chose to work on things that didn't require too much focus or concentration, allowing me to kind of quickly stop what I was doing, um, chat and move from one thing to another. So you can see I had kind of my, my laptop and hard drives and a printer, and I was kind of printing things and sequencing things. Um, but in addition to printing out work proofs, um, I was also gathering m new material in the form of still images and video recorded directly inside the little airport studio. I um, had a really fun time bringing in materials from the construction site itself and gathering kind of limestone and mud some of the grasses from the peripheral wetlands. And this kind of, here's an image of one of those still lifes that I made. This last aspect I really enjoyed because it allowed me to respond to those materials and that uh, the matter of the construction site in a different way than I would in the field itself. I, you know, found that I could kind of pay attention to these items in, in a more uh, precise manner. For some reason, I really loved this I guess it's limestone. I'm not a geologist. I think it's limestone. Um, but the way that it's so porous like that and it takes on the, the imprint of the materials that come in contact with it, almost looking like these little fossils. Um, this was another favorite as well, was this caked glove, uh, this remnant of a worker that had left behind. This has turned into a complete abstraction, but um, it is, in fact, you can kind of make out the fingers of the glove there. Um, so... Uh, at this point, and this is just another install shot of me videotaping video off of the monitor of my laptop of some fabricated sand mountains that I had made. Um, so I had a good time in the studio. So you should come hang out with me. <laughs> um, so, but at this point, um, it, it would probably be useful to contextualize the work I'm doing here with some of my past projects to give a sense of um, you know, how I do this, how I tend to respond to spaces that shift or change, either through man-made or environmental occurrences, and how I even got there, because I didn't start working in landscape. It just sort of, I found my way there. Um, so this project called Goldfields came about when I was an artist in residence of a very different kind at the Visual Arts Center of La Trobe University in Bendigo, Australia, back in 2011. And in this instance, I spent um, around three weeks in residence, prior to which time um, I heavily researched the region's history. And the way I was thinking about this project was um, kind of as a critical consideration of cultural memory in relation to the opposing perspectives of indigenous and colonial settler narratives, um, pastoral landscape representations, folklore, and myth. So you think about the... Um, 
the sort of Aboriginal mythology of Australia and the, the gold mining that took place during uh, this part of the region's history, there's a lot of stuff colliding together there, and that's um, sort of what I was responding to in the space. And so, sorry. Um, my process in this uh, work involved working in the former mining sites for which the region is known and named, um, responding to the space and gathering material, still and video, in a manner that's very similar to the way that I'm working on the airport project. And in this instance, I was primarily working in two different ways. Uh, one way was just kind of responding to the space, looking at non-manipulated, found portions of recognizable landscape spaces that we know. And another thread was to make these more constructed landscape images. And for this work, I was purposefully using uh, gold paper, sorry, uh, gold paper, glitter, fabric, and other materials um, meant to purposefully reference the history within these spaces of the gold mining. And I was trying to be pretty careful to avoid really overtly literal references. I was working in a deliberately loose, almost kind of clumsy manner with these kinds of fabrications. You can kind of see the paper just barely attached to that tree there. Um, so, but during my stay here and in my you know, conversations with people in the region, I became really interest in, uh, more interested in that history of gold mining and its effects on the transformation of the landscape, both physically and culturally. And so the work that I made here was exhibited in, in quite a few different forms. Um, as a triple, uh, triple screen installation in Melbourne, Australia, which later traveled to Portland, and here is an uh, installation view of that. Um, and it was also exhibited as a slightly more immersive video installation with accompanying photographs at uh, Murray State in Kentucky. And here you can see there's a, a different sort of setup there with the photographs included as well. Um, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm not going to screen the, the video of this right now, but it is available on my website, um, dawnroad.com. It's super easy to find, and you can view that. Uh, but I do want to say that, um, so when I was working in the field, when I was in Australia, kind of capturing all this material, um, these overlapping concerns that I touched on in the beginning around kind of landscape and time and memory, as, as well as the very particular nature of uh, photographic methodologies. Those things were certainly present while I was capturing the footage, um, but the critical consideration of these aspects occurred retrospectively. Um, when I returned to the studio and began to craft the sequences and combine the imagery, which again is very similar to my current process. It's one thing when I'm gathering the footage on the site, I've got a certain kind of thinking process that's happening. And then when I'm working with this stuff at a remove in the solitary confines of my studio, um, the thinking becomes a little bit different. So um, I just think that's significant to uh, the process for this work as well as the airport project. Uh, one of the things that was mentioned about the Goldfields work in the exhibition catalog that accompanied it was um, artist Leon Pahapil writes, quote, in Dawn's patterning of moving sequences punctuated by still images, she mimics our activity as viewers as we navigate the terrain of experience and representation. By creating this formal echo, she draws our attention to the ways in which form and content reinforce one another, that selfhood and being are embedded in cultural memory and historical belonging, end quote. And ultimately, that's, that's really kind of what I'm up to. That's my investigation, that navigate, navigation of the terrain of experience within or simultaneous to representation, because they're not the same thing. They can't uh, really uh, necessarily be the same. Experience is inherently different from representation. It's being represented again. So there was no way to separate the cultural and historical memory that persists within the space of the gold fields from my own understanding of the space as experienced. So these works are very much reliant upon the sites where they were made and the specificity of that history. But I, I want to acknowledge that that was a really new way of working for me. That was the first project that um, necessitated a certain site-specific kind of manner of working. 
Most of my previous projects relied much more heavily on a, a more ambiguous type of space or place. In fact, the work that immediately preceded the Goldfields project was called The Tree Alone, and it looked to the landscape as subject matter, but the spaces depicted were much less relevant uh, to the work as a whole, or at least uh, not relevant in the same manner. And this is another interesting or important area, sorry, for me to think around, because the photographic depictions are not terribly distinct between this image from the gold fields that we just looked at and this image of the bare tree made in uh, Asheville, North Carolina. So in terms of the way I'm describing it with the camera and what you can see or glean from it. Um, so one might suggest that I could have made the gold fields work in almost any forest space, which relates to the relationship between the subject matter itself and the subject of the work. And the same could possibly be said about many of the images I'm gathering here at the airport. Ostensibly, these really could have been made anywhere around any construction site. And it's that universality, though, that's really an inherent aspect of the very nature of constructed space. And as well, even though they could have been made anywhere, they weren't, and they, I may not have been prompted in the same way had I not been responding to this precise site. So it's, it's an, just an interesting area to think around. What do we know from a photograph based on what we're being told by the caption, and, and what do we know based on how we're seeing it? So as you can imagine, this leads me to think around questions of authenticity in terms of photographic representation. And it's a fun preoccupation, actually. I like thinking about that. Um, but it has a lot to do with why I don't necessarily consider myself to be a, quote, documentary photographer, at least not in the way that uh, term has been traditionally understood. Um, but to speak of landscape as a genre more generally, that as well is a relatively new space for me to be working in. Um, you know, really I've always considered my work in many ways to kind of just be a study of poignancy. You know, why do we respond emotively to, at all to images in the way that we do? And my earlier projects often centered upon sites of significance. <clears throat> they might have been familiar interior spaces, a lot of the time my own home. Um, as well, referencing past and present time. I'm going to jump back in time a little bit here. Um, referencing past and present time by combining the still and moving image through singular or repeated photographs and digital video is a strategy I've also been working with for a while now. So I want to show a couple brief examples that sort of trace my history moving from um, more straightforward kind of single image photographic work such as you see here um, to combined imagery in the form of diptychs or triptychs or strips of images as well as video. and. So these two images are from a series called The Space of Daydream. And they, yeah, they were made in about 2005. And they were very much influenced by um, a book that someone gave to me during that time called The Poetics of Space by Gaston Bachelard, which is just um, a beautiful text. And while I was working on this series, I was kind of already thinking about how to expand a moment beyond a single photographic frame. These are actually self-portraits, although I don't necessarily consider them that. They're just kind of in them. <laughs> um, but so what came after this was a series called Interior Landscape. And this was where the figure, somewhat surprisingly, um, disappeared from my work. Prior to this um, and the series before, I'd worked in the uh, realm of portraiture for quite some time. And I really felt that the kind of psychological content that interested me was reliant upon the human form. And it was the space of daydream series that we just saw prior that led me to realize the spaces the body inhabited really held equal weight, which led me to start paying attention to empty spaces and later, as we know, out into the landscape itself. Uh, this is another from interior landscape. You can see that window calling me. Eventually I go out the window. Um, which we'll see next in. But, but as I was making this work, actually, interior landscape, um, I was starting to become really interested in ideas and theories of time, memory, and perception. And I was reading a lot of literature that influenced my thinking around this, uh, most notably Marcel Proust's Remembrance of Things Past and two novels by Virginia Woolf, um, The Waves and To the Lighthouse. And I was also becoming really um, influenced by the philosophical theories of phenomenology. 
and was particularly impacted by two books, um, Henri Bergson's Matter and Memory and Maurice Merleau-Ponty's Phenomenology of Perception. All of those I would recommend. Go get that stack and have a great fall reading session. Um, but so the next series after that called From Time to Time began around 2009. And it was here that I started to use both single and multiple images, partly because I started to question kind of um, the assumed, quote, instant of individual photograph which seemed at times um, just kind of insufficient for what I was trying to get at. And so I started to work with the diptych or a series in combination with a single channel video. This is another diptych from that series. Um, so as well, I returned to working with the moving image. My undergraduate degree was actually um, completed in partial fulfillment at the Northwest Film Center in Portland. I started, when I went back to school, I was studying experimental film, which I left behind for still photography for many years, and now I've kind of come back to using both of them together. Um, so here's an example of how the um, still photographs function with video running alongside, and I'll let this run through. So interesting for me to do these talks sometimes because I look at stuff I haven't seen in so long and it just it strikes me differently than it did the time I made it. So it's nice to do that. Um, but okay, so here's something from about 2010. So eventually it, it just, I realized that um, I'm continually being drawn to the use of landscape as my subject matter. And so I just give in and kind of go out into the world. Um, so for about three years, I worked on a group of images that would later form the series, The Weight of Centuries, which takes its title from a line in Virginia Woolf's novel, The Waves. And in that text, she writes, quote, I hate all details of the individual life, but I am fixed here to listen. An immense pressure is on me. I cannot move without dislodging the weight of centuries. And as mentioned earlier, at first I was a bit unsure how to negotiate within the very loaded art historical territory of landscape. So there's a passage in Rebecca Solnit's text, River of Shadows, which relates nicely to my thinking. She, she writes when speaking of photographer Edward Mybridge's early um, Yosemite photographs from the early 1900s, she says, quote, Though landscape's obvious subject is space, its deepest theme is time. Images of lush landscapes speak of the organic and cyclical time of plant life and the daily cycle of light and darkness. Photographs speak as well of the moment of vision the photographer made permanent, of the split second to minutes the aperture of the camera was open and light poured on the film. So while I'm working on site here at the airport, Many of these ideas are continuing to drive this work and impact the choices that I make in terms of which aspects of the site I pay attention to and depict. And the, this project has led me to really continue to consider the significance of landscape to the content of my work, something that I'm constantly thinking through and trying to be really careful at how I negotiate. Um, there's another really nice quote that I reference often Another great book, Simon Shama, has a book called Landscape and Memory, and in that book he writes, quote, 
Landscapes are culture before they are nature, constructs of the imagination projected onto wood and water and rock. But it should also be acknowledged that once a certain idea of landscape, a myth, a vision, establishes itself in an actual place, it has a peculiar way of muddling categories, of making metaphors more real than their reference, of becoming, in fact, a part of the scenery. Hence my desire to call this uh, a moonscape. Uh, there was often a lot of conversation about how the top of the, the hill up there looked like kind of a, an arid desert space or an, a planetary kind of expanse. So that's something we've projected onto it. So, so you might notice that I pay attention to perhaps maybe peculiar aspects of landscape, not always the picturesque. Um, I find myself drawn to things like this really beautiful twisted pile of rebar and concrete being torn apart here. And in general, you might sense that it's a more kind of sublime type of beauty that I find myself interested in. One that contains that certain kind of sense of unease, referencing, referencing maybe a vast and indefinable space. And there's also a kind of slowness inherent to landscape that is something that I choose to attempt to exploit, I suppose, in terms of how I choose to represent it in photographs or video works. And again, this has an attempt at, uh, to do with an attempt at referencing the inherent loss and longing that are attached to the passage of time. And you'll notice um, the video works that I'm showing you today are all silent, and that's purposeful. The emphasis there is on the, the visual perception. And you probably notice that when you view silent works, the um, the encounter seems a bit prolonged. It tests your patience a bit. There's no kind of audio to go along with that. So um, I'm going to show you another silent video clip on that note. Funny as I was watching that as well, if, if any of you know the films of the Russian filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky, you can see his influence absolutely seeping through. He's a major influence on mine. There's a film called Stalker. If you haven't seen it, you'll love it. That heavily influenced, I admit it. Um, so, but it, it's, it remains really interesting for me to think about the sheer amount of volume and mass involved in this project, right? Here's Here's a bunch of that fill that made its way up to um, what is now the, the paved runway. And the fact that you know, this enormous amount of tonnage is being transported from one place to another to make this happen. And you know, here's a, another abstraction created from some of that, um, the concrete mix for the runway. But So that coupled with the fact that this kind of mini mountain is being built on top of a swamp is endlessly fascinating to me. And so, this image, even though it was made in direct proximity to the construction site right on along Griffin Road, um, I've also spent some time in the nearby Everglades during my visits trying to think about the very peculiar ecosystem that is at the heart of Florida's landscape. And some of the images I've created serve to contrast this kind of vast natural world with the built environment. And so when I was in residence last May, I was able to photograph the runway in its almost complete form and it was interesting, actually, during my talk last May, um, Aviation Department Deputy Director Doug Webster, who is not here tonight, but he had these really um, interesting insights about the fact that this space is inevitably, inevitably going to transform into just an everyday recognizable space. It's not going to seem extraordinary in the least. And so what is now perceived as this ordered yet chaotic site will soon become really entirely familiar to us all. And 
for some reason, I was thinking about all of that, the runway itself, the expanse, um, on one of my trips into the Everglades, kind of looking at the sky and the horizon and linking the birds in flight to the vast empty space and of sky and water to that kind of expanse of the long, uninterrupted surface of the runway and just that sameness of the blue above. So it's, it's just a, a really kind of unique space, this, this region of Florida that is, even though I live only four hours north of here, it's every time I come down here, it's very, very different um, atmospherically. So, um, so the images that I've shown you tonight um, are not necessarily going to be included in the final works. This, as I said, I've amassed an archive and then some of it will you know, end up in, as works in the airport, but and the biggest challenge of my process has been sorting through all of this and figuring out what, what's going to sort of work um, as, as a final artwork. And so this, is, um, this image here is kind of one option that I've given for a particular wall mural. And uh, this is a crude mock-up of one of the proposed pieces uh, for eventual installation um, takes the form of there will be these two digital kiosks and you know they're the kind that are normally used for commercial advertisements and it was really challenging to think about um, what sort of imagery might I use for these works due to their unconventional nature both in terms of how you would encounter the work as well as its format that you know slim vertical rectangle and you know one day I was out going for a run all these random thoughts come to me while I'm running and I started kind of thinking about the Earth horizon and the symmetry it helps produce when it's perceived in the form of that traditional, you know, rectangular landscape we're accustomed to, running generally straight through the picture plane or perceptual field, left to right, that horizon. Yet that same type of balance can also be present in the form of an angular line, perhaps the tilt of a hill against the sky or as a vertical slice running up and down. You can think about what it looks like when you're gazing towards the landscape on your side. And so thinking about that really helped me conceptualize a visual structure for the videos that might work in those kiosks. And I realized um, I might be able to present scenes or spaces that were purposefully recorded horizontally as vertical images, playing on that balance and symmetry and also purposefully introducing elements of abstraction. So in closing, I'm just gonna give you guys a sneak peek little preview of one of the videos that I pr I've proposed for the panel to go in these kiosks, and after that, I'll be happy to chat with you more. So, let's watch this.
open it back up in case we want to refer to any of the other images. Um, so yeah, that's that for now. Um, thanks. <laughs> Was there anything that came up that um, any of you were curious about? Yeah. Um, yeah, I responded to a request for qualifications that was put out by, I believe, the Cultural Division way back in December of 2012. And, and actually, yeah, I, I was really glad that it came across my email inbox because the way it was described after I had just finished working on that Goldfields project, I was really, that's the kind of stuff I was thinking about, you know, like, oh, a, a space that's um, going to go through transformation. You know, I was thinking about all these mining fields that were dug out. So it suited my working method. So I responded and I went through the proposal process and I was really, really fortunate that they selected me. They took a chance on me. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, there were a, a couple of different, a safety vest goes a long way and a hard hat, I learned. Um, I was escorted onto the site as much as possible by different um, people from different, uh, lots of high up people had to escort me around. I felt really bad about it sometimes, but they were all so sweet. But I was given the sort of advice from one of the um, construction members that it would probably be okay if I wandered around with hard hat and a vest to the periphery like I couldn't go through the gated areas unless I was escorted but yeah only like two times did I get actually chased away and I think once I had sandals on and not my closed toed shoes so bad me um, but uh, amazingly I was able to get kind of the access I needed more so than than not and but being able like the footage that I got from that last clip that you saw I wouldn't have had access to if I wasn't escorted literally onto the runway um, but yeah, that was, th that aspect was curious. <laughs> yeah. Did you? I didn't come down before I submitted, but they had provided a lot of really nice documentation and a, a ton of, like a big um, PDF document with loads of information. Um, so I had a sense of what was going on. I mean, it's a completely unique call. I have to give credit to Christina, who's sitting in the back, because she kind of, this was her brainchild largely was, um, I can, she can perhaps tell you the story, but it's, it's, not the, the, it's not a standard kind of call for public art the residency program is not generally attached to a public art project. The construction in and of itself is unique. So, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it, I, I took a stab at it when I re responded to the request and, you know, it's become what it's become. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah. It couldn't have been more perfect timing, and it, it, it's exciting for me because it's helping me further my, my sort of research practice, too, around my thinking about this kind of site-specific work um, that does simultaneously rely on a space, but that imagery is sort of divorced from it at the same time. It's, it's, it's uh, tickling my theoretical fancy. <laughs> yes. There is a lot of dust. 
<laughs> Sorry. It's very dirty. Uh, no, I actually, I'm, I'm partly joking, but partly not, because that does interfere with the camera equipment sometimes. So, and it was just, it's Florida. It's, I, I got to know the noceums very well. Um, but the challenge was, and actually this is very true, um, you probably noticed a big shift in the type of imagery. I normally preferred a much heavier kind of darkness, a darker sky, um, under shade, nighttime. I had to learn to work with daylight a little bit more and kind of embrace that um, because that was when I had access to the site a bit more. But it actually became important to the work because the sky is so much to do with this particular project for me, those bits of fill in relation to that sky. But I want to say too that I, I love that it's conjuring a response that relates to another um, period of construction too, because even though this is about this period right now, I can't go by any construction site anywhere without thinking about this. You know, I was in Iceland and every, it, for a little bit in June, and I kept trying to think if these natural formations were construction sites. It was, everything looks like a construction site to me now, but um, my other point around that was that I was on site with Alan, I can't remember Alan's last name, but he takes me on, what's his last name? Siegel? Okay. Um, and we were talking about just the fact that the airport will never really not be under construction, right? There, every airport is constantly under some sort of transformation. So that's, that's an interesting part of it, too. It's just this kind of constant um, reality. Ice cubes. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. What, what else could I answer? Yeah. I wasn't given any direction whatsoever. That I have to um, say that has been a really fantastic aspect. I was I've never been told what kind of imagery to produce, or I've just been I've constantly been you know letting them see what I've been doing. Uh, the reason that there are some airplanes in is they're actually it's really really hard to they're constantly flying by, but it's really hard to kind of get them perfectly. And and I didn't necessarily want to constantly have that that much of an obvious reference, but I like how they punctuate the space sometimes. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I would say so for sure. I mean, that, that aspect of um, um, Perceptual consideration is important to me, and that might be something that allowed me to get to love the blue a bit. I mean, if you want to think about impressionism and the way that blue functions in the, I, the, and well, just the atmosphere in general. I, in another talk, I, I went on at length a little bit about the, how different the blue sky can be from season to season here, and, and just the, the, the way that the clouds transform that flat space so drastically, but but yeah, I mean, this particular image is probably not the best example because it's quite flat, and, um, but there are, are others that have a more impressionistic quality. Yeah, probably that moves. Hmm. In most instances, I, anytime I'm combining, well, actually there is no rule to that, but in this instance, it's the same time and it's a slight, it'll be either an exposure variance or a purposeful um, manipulation of the, the way I'm treating the image. So you can see on the left, that one is a little bit, well, actually what it was was I had turned one way and then the light was another way when I, my lens was looking this way, which is why the foreground looks um, so much brighter and the background so much darker. Because, you, I mean, that's one of the things that we don't necessarily notice as we're in the world. Our eyes just constantly adjust to things, but the camera lens is very different in that way. And that's, yeah, so for sure, that's one of the things that I want to emphasize are those subtle shifts that occur. Yeah. Ooh, I'm toasty. Yes. Mm 
Yes. Yeah. And that I like, I mean, that's, that's why also I purposefully work with still photographs and video because without them together, you don't necessarily jump to that association. Um, like, so with the Goldfield installation that I showed you, that actually has audio with it. So when you're in the gallery, you're um, experiencing audio with those um, visuals, and then you're looking at the photographs that have the audio as well. But in other instances, I, I show the photographs and the video, and there's no audio with either. And it does, it's an eerie, it's kind of uncanny when you, there's an expectations, expectation for sound. It also tells you, cues you into when something's going to start or finish sometimes with a moving image. Yeah. Yes. Tomorrow, um, my idea is to um, talk to people this week about, here's been sort of what my response has been to this project over the last 15 months, and I've got a bunch of work prints and some other things to look at as well as videos, and I've got a whole gaggle of art supplies, and what I want is for the public and your students to work with me and think about, okay, what would your creative response be to this scenario? If you were given sort of a set of circumstances, um, some materials to play around with, you can fabricate, you can respond to what's actually there, you can, um, you don't necessarily have to keep this to the visual realm either. Interestingly enough, in this original call, um, it discussed the possibility of poetry or music. Um, I think it would be really fun to have a conversation with others. What is your creative response to this? How? You know, it's, it's not, on the surface, the most exciting thing necessarily to make art about hmm, a construction project. But in the end, actually, well, it is. So, so yeah, basically, you will get to spend time with me with the, the light boxes that are on view. We can talk a little bit more about my process and how I created that work. And then we'll, we'll make some new stuff, you know, just for the sake of making it. That's... is I think you guys are going to get down there about one till whenever you feel like leaving. <laughs> Airport doesn't close. I guess we could party all night. <laughs> in Terminal 2, uh, the easiest thing would be to park in the um, hourly uh, on the bottom area, which is across from baggage claim. And then you walk in at baggage claim and you take the escalators up. If you're facing the terminal, it's on the right side. And it's pre-security, but it looks like it's behind security. It's next to a bulk sweet shop. Is that a good description? Okay. Yeah, the Lee Wagoner Art Gallery. It's actually really easy. Terminal 2 areas, it's small. You can't, someone would um, direct you there if you can't find it. I will have the camera and... I've already printed everything all out, so we won't necessarily print stuff, but I've got, <clears throat> we can re-photograph things, we can play with um, materials to make still lifes, I've got drawing pads, I've got clay, I've got different colored papers, I've got dirt. I don't have too much stuff that's going to make a mess. I didn't get any um, pastels. <laughs> yeah, um, but also I've got, you know, I, I'm a strong believer in that you can, you can make quite a bit with very little. Um, I think even just language is, um, I'd be interested in just having a, uh, maybe we'll write a play. Maybe we'll, we'll uh, make it a, a two act play. <laughs> Who knows? Sorry, was there another question? Yeah. <clears throat> Will what be up? <clears throat> The work that's in the Lee Wagner Gallery now is coming down on October 13th or 14th, at which time that gallery is actually going away, <clears throat> as I understand. And then it's going to be relocated to Terminal 3. And then some other works, they're still determining locations for where those will go. But once those have been determined, the, they maintain a really nice website, um, which tells you where kind of all the public works are if you go to the airport public arts section. Yes.
Yeah, I mean, I've been working on other things simultaneous to this. Um, um, one pro it's, it's definitely led me to start working with this one series where the photographs are very much, they're, not, they're no longer diptychs or triptychs, they're strips. They're very long strips that it take, uh, they're large, so maybe about, oops, sorry, about the size of that banner. <laughs> so yes. Wow, so we made it through. We almost closed the place down. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>